This is Stand Up For The Truth, addressing important issues and topics affecting Christians across the nation. Good morning. It is Friday, September 20, 2024. I'm Crash Connell. Welcome to a fresh new podcast. One of your favorite guests is back. Mary Danielson yes. is here. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Stand Up For The Truth. It is my pleasure to chat with Ray Comfort today in our first half. I have a tremendous amount of respect for him and all that the Ministry of Living Waters does for the kingdom. My scripture this morning, and after that we will pray, and we will just get on with the interview. Isaiah 118 is my verse. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Ah, Pray with me this morning. Lord, you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. You will that none should perish. Lord, open our eyes daily to the war that we are in for men's souls. Lord, break our hearts for the lost. Give us increasing measures of empathy and loving kindness for those that we meet, those who may be blind to their own spiritual condition. Lord, we ask that you'd equip us and open doors for us. We lift up Ray and the Living Water staff. Thank you for their, ob- for their obedience to the Great Commission. And we ask for continued endurance in this race, for wisdom in all things, traveling mercies, much fruit for the kingdom, for good health, and to continue to bring the reality of eternity to anyone who will listen. In Jesus' name, amen. Ray Comfort is founder and CEO of Living Waters, a best-selling author, and he's written more than 100 books, including the Evidence Study Bible. He co-hosts the award-winning television program Way of the Master, which airs in 190 countries and is in its ninth season. Their Living Waters podcast and their online school of evangelism, award-winning videos such as 180, The Atheist Delusion, Evolution versus God, Audacity, Genius, and many more have been viewed 250 million times and are also available on the website, which is a tremendous resource for sharing the gospel. A lot of great tools to help us get past any reservations we might have in sharing the gospel. His latest book, 50 Years of Open Air Preaching, Everything I've Learned is a Treat. Ray, welcome to Stand Up for the Truth. Thanks for having me on. I I noticed you mentioned the movie we made, Genius. Yes. And I made that movie because uh, when we produced 180, people would come up to me and say, you're the 180 guy. (laughs) So we produced Genius, hoping they would say that, but they didn't. (laughs) You're the Genius guy. I like that. (laughs) It never happened. Oh, that's funny. Uh, And I enjoyed both videos very, very much. Now, 50 years, that is such a legacy. There's a definition in in your book of open-air preaching. It starts at the very beginning. It says, going somewhere I don't want to go to preach a message I don't want to preach to people who don't want to hear it, but the love of Christ compels me. And after watching you for so many years, what always stands out is your compassion for people and, and your courage and boldness. It really is a testimony to the church as well as the world. Now, Ray, you left your comfort zone in the rearview mirror. A lot of us have comfort zones, but you left yours way back in the early 70s. You were working at a business in New Zealand at the time. The Lord started to speak to your heart about the loss. Now, I want to ask you, was this something that happened over time, or was the desire to speak in the public square about the, you know, about the lost and the gospel, was that something that happened pretty quickly in your walk? It wasn't, wasn't a desire that I wanted. Even <laughs> slightly. When I was 16, I was asked to make a, a school speech. All the members of the class had to give a speech, and mine was on surfing, which I loved, stood up and dried up. I absolutely froze. <laughs> my mind went blank. My mm. mouth went dry, and I sat down humiliated in front mm. of my classmates. It was a horrific experience, and I vowed never, ever to preach or speak in public mm. again. And then I became a Christian at the age of uh, 22, and I had this overwhelming concern that people were going to hell, this moral obligation that I'd found a cure to death when all around me people were dying. Mm. I remember I was sitting on a bus on my way to work once. I had a business. And I used to make leather jackets for people. And I looked at all the people bouncing around on the bus and thought, man, most of these probably people are going to hell. They're captive by the power of death and the fear of death. I wish I could just stand up and and preach the gospel to them, but I thought the bus would stop, and in unison, the driver and the people would throw me off, and I prayed a very dangerous prayer. I said, oh God, if there's only somewhere I could stand up and preach the gospel, knowing that there wasn't, because our city of Christchurch in New Zealand was a city of 350,000 people, I wouldn't allow public speaking. You couldn't gather a crowd Mm. unlawfully. You had to have a permit, and uh, so I I thought, I'm safe, And and yet two weeks later, they legalized public speaking in the heart of our city, open an area called the Speaker's Corner, 
And I, I was horrified and I ignored the, the whole thought of it for about two weeks until I saw in a local newspaper a picture of an elderly lady with a violin and a Bible in her hand. And it said the Bible lady sharing her Christian faith in Speaker's Corner. And I felt ashamed. So I went in, got courage from somewhere, preached to a group of people and went back 3,000 times over a 12-year period. And uh, did it get easier? No. Mm -hmm. The second time was harder than the first because mm -hmm. the first time you do it, you appease your conscience and say, well, there, <laughs> I did it. And you want to relax. But you've got to you know, pull yourself together and say, I'm going to keep doing this because people are going to hell and we have everlasting life as a free gift of God. And how can we not but speak that which we've seen and heard? Right, right. And there's always just, uh, as humans, that, that uncomfortableness because you're telling people they're sinners. People don't necessarily want or like to hear that. You're interrupting their day about something they may never have even considered at all or the fact that they'll die like everyone else. And so breaking the ice with people... Uh, must be a bit of a challenge because you're about to deliver something very heavy. Um, like I said, you're interrupting their thoughts about something that really is the most important thing they'll ever think about on any given day. So how, how have you found a way to break the ice with people? Are there, are there ways that you can uh, open, start to cr uh, get your foot in the door, for lack of a better phrase, when you, when you begin these uh, events? Yeah, there is a wonderful way. For the first 10 years, I found it very difficult because I used to start with an interesting anecdote. Something would capture attention. And there was always that pressure to come up with something fresh each day, especially mm -hmm. when this, <laughs> the same crowd often would sit around for lunch. So uh, about 30 years ago, I discovered something absolutely wonderful. I began to use trivia uh, as mm. an ear, ear grabber. I would just stand up with a bunch of $1 in my hand, $1 bills, and so, okay, I got some trivia for, for you. I'm giving away money here. Uh, first question, what's the capital of Paris? Sorry, what's the capital of France? And someone will call that Paris. And so that's great. Now, ask these very easy trivia questions and give away a dollar when somebody got it right. It's like 24 and 8. Someone will say, 20. That's right. You must be a university student. Here's a dollar for you. And it would create goodwill, good feeling. And then I watch for the person in the crowd that was kind of confident, would answer questions without any, you know, hesitation. Mm -hmm. And I said, what's your name? He says, Eric, Eric, jump up on the box there. We're going to go for uh, $20. Uh, if you think you're a good person, I'll give you $20. And if you're not a good person, I'll give you $20 anyway. You want to do that? He mm -hmm. says, yeah, sure. I say, we're going to go through the Ten Commandments. Candle. Can you handle that? He says, absolutely, no problem at all. He's not fearful of the commandments because he thinks he's a good person. And then we go through the commandments. He finds out he's a liar, a thief, a blasphemer, fornicator, an adulterer at heart, and he has to face God on Judgment Day. So we go through the, the law, the Ten Commandments, into the cross, the good news that Christ paid the fine on the cross, rose from the dead, defeated death, and all he needed to do to find everlasting life is repent and trust in the God-given Savior. And people would listen. They don't feel intimidated when you're speaking to one guy in a box, but they hear the gospel. So I've been doing that for about 30 years, mm -hmm. and it's been very effective. And it means that anyone can start. You can go to a local university, stand up on a soapbox and say, i got some trivia for you, giving away $1 bills to get it right. Here we go. Mm -hmm. And people will listen. Yeah. Yeah. Some people might say, right, when they're sitting, I can never do that. Well, you're just qualifying yourself for an open-air preacher, if you say, I can never do that, because you're saying, I don't have anything to give. Yeah. Well, then you're God's material. I, I meet people that say, I say, you got a bucket list, even Christians. Yeah, I want to skydive. You want to skydive? I, I, I feel I said, don't be so stupid. What's what's your last thoughts as you hit the ground and you, and you give up your family for an adrenaline buzz? If you want an adrenaline buzz, just go to your local university. You won't risk your life, more than likely, mm -hmm. and you'll do something productive and uh, so if you love fear, open air preach. And if you can't open air preach, just do one to one. Mm -hmm. Open air preaching is one to a hundred. Yeah. It's the same as one to one, but with more people. Yeah. Well, and you're just wise. You're just drawing people in. Um, that's just a brilliant way to do it. Now, I, I first heard about you through Hell's Best Kept Secret. We had a church bookstore at the time and the book just flew off the shelves. Uh, tell us how that came about and what was it about the evangelical methods of the day that really seem to fall short of making true converts? Because I think this book, Hell's Best Kept Secret, and, and just watching you use that particular um, methodology, for lack of a better word, has just really opened my eyes to what people need to hear. How did Hell's Best Kept Secret come about? I was uh, sitting in my office on, a, I think, a Friday afternoon, thinking about how I just discovered that 90% of uh, professed converts fell away from the faith. That is, 9 out of 10 at older calls were falling away. 
I couldn't figure it out. It just didn't make sense because I knew it was true in large crusades and even in our local church. And I was reading a portion by a sermon by Charles Spurgeon in which he said this. What will you do when the law comes in terror? When the trumpet of the archangel shall tear you from your grave? When the eyes of God shall burn their way into your guilty soul? When the book shall be opened and all your sin and shame shall be punished? How can you stand against an angry law in that day? Mm. And I thought, man, that's a little different from God loves you and has a wonderful <laughs> plan for your life. Yeah. So I tucked it in my memory banks and traveled 100 miles to speak at a Presbyterian church. And uh, before I preached, I opened the Bible at Galatians 3.24. And it said, wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And I thought, yep, it was a schoolmaster to bring Israel to Christ. And I thought, it doesn't mm. say that. It says our I wonder if Spurgeon was right. You can open up the Ten Commandments and show someone their need. So I went to a local uh, thermal pool. It was a very cold day, sat in, and I thought, I'm going to share the commandments next time someone sit next to me. And this big guy sat down, and I and I opened up. I said, got to know him, and I said, uh, you believe in an afterlife? And I said, you're going to stand before God on Judgment Day? How are you going to do? He said, good. I said, well, let's go through the Ten Commandments and see how you do. And after I went through the commandments and shared the cross, he stood up, and I'll never forget this because it was cold, and he was steaming, and he said, <laughs> I've never heard that put so clear in all my mm. life. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, the Lord brought the knowledge of sin, as it says mm -hmm. in the book of Romans. Uh, Paul said, I had not known uh, sin but by the law. It was a schoolmaster to bring him right. to Christ. And so uh, I began teaching it. I uh, called it Hell's Best Kept Secret. In fact, the publishers hated that title. Hmm. They said, no, too heavy. And three months later, they said, we've been thinking again. I, I submitted, I think, 75 alternative uh, titles for the book wow. for the one they gave me. They told me, uh, we'll call it Watering Down the Gospel, and that made me feel <laughs> sick. It was so weak. Wow. And uh, they changed their minds after three months and said, that does sound like a good title. So we mm. went with it. I'm so pleased we did. Yeah. Because it certainly is hell's best kept secret. Yes. Let me just share an analogy, if I may. Yeah. Which brings out why it's so, why it's so important. I ask people, Christians and non-Christians alike, if you're a doctor and you had a patient before you who thought he was well, very, very fit and healthy looking guy, he goes to the gym every day, Schwarzenegger figure, but you knew he was dying. He had two weeks to live. You'd seen x-rays. You've got a cure in your pocket. Do you give them the cure or show them the x-rays? And Often people say, no, you give them the cure straight away because he's dying. I say, that's not going to work. And they say, why not? Well, he thinks he's healthy. Mm -hmm. He's going to say, what are you giving me this cure for? Mm -hmm. Look at me. I go to the gym every day. Are you crazy? No, no. If the doctor knows what he's doing, he's going to point to the x-rays. Show him the poison seeping through his system. Let him sweat. Let him tremble to a point where he says, whoa, doc, this is serious. What should I do? Now he's ready for the cure. Now he's going to appreciate it and appropriate it. And what we have done in America in the last 50, 60 years is we've held up the cure. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't know John 3.16? And who doesn't say, yeah, I know Christ died for my sins. I'm a good person. I don't need that junk. No, they need to be shown the x-rays. We need to do what Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount. We need to do what Jesus did with a rich young ruler. You know the commandments, Jesus said to him. And, put, and Jesus opened up that law on the Sermon on the Mount. And when we open up the law and show them the x-rays, that if you hate someone, you're a murderer. That if you get angry without cause, you're in danger of judgment. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Look at a woman with lust. You commit adultery in your heart. In God's eyes, then they'll begin to tremble. Then fear does its work, and they say, well, what should I do? So every sinner needs his own uh, Philippian jailer earthquake. Yeah. We need to do what Paul did and reason with sinners. Yeah about righteousness, temperance, and judgment, and make Felix tremble, mm -hmm. because it'll make them say, whoa, this is serious. Mm -hmm. What should I do? And then they're ready for the gospel. Yeah, absolutely. Well, very well said. Uh, livingwaters.com. This is Mary Danielson. You're listening to Stand Up For The Truth. Ray Comfort is my guest. 50 years of open-air preaching, everything I've learned. Now, you left New Zealand in around 1989 to bring the ministry to the States. Is that a direct result of the success of Hell's Best Kept Secret? Yes and no. We hadn't published Hell's Best Kept Secret until oh. I got to the States. Okay. But I, I I, had to minister in Hawaii uh, seven times. I got flown from New Zealand to Hawaii. Someone has to do it. And uh, a pastor from California, Calvary Chapel pastor, sat in and listened, and he disagreed. And he, he, mm. he began studying scriptures I gave him on the plane back to California. And he said that on the way back, 
that God spoke to his heart. He's not a God told me, he just said it was strongly impressed on him mm. to fly me from New Zealand to the US, uh, particularly bring the teaching to the church. He changed his mind. And uh, things were quiet for the first three years. So I received a phone call from uh, David Wilkerson, who had heard oh, the teaching yeah. in New York, flew me to New York, had me to give the teaching to his church. And then another well-known minister called and said, I just heard this teaching. I want you to share it with a thousand pastors. And I did. And he put it on video and screened that video to 30,000 pastors. So doors opened that I couldn't open. And then in mm -hmm. 2001, I think it was, the actor Kirk Cameron heard the teaching and said, boy, this has absolutely changed my life. And he wanted to combine ministries, and we did. And he preached from my notes, Hell's Best Kept Secret, on a major network, uh, uh, um, the biggest Christian network. They said, oh, our ratings went through the roof. Uh, mm -hmm. Come back and do it again. Our website actually crashed. And he said, no, we won't do it. But what we will do is we'll make a television program called The Way of the Master, in which oh. we will uh, teach Christians how to share their faith biblically. Yeah. So. That And we're in just moving into our 10th season of Way of the Master. So I look back and I'm just amazed yeah. at the doors that God opened because uh, one preacher once said to me, how do you get an international ministry like you've got? I says, it's really easy. You just get an insanely popular actor, Hollywood actor, to call and join ministries with you and you're set. Mm -hmm. And it just makes me smile because you can't instigate something like that. No, no you absolutely cannot. Um so, uh, you know, this The Way of the Master, I just want to talk about that just a little bit. I've enjoyed many of them on, on DVD. The, the, one in, the ones in Europe, that really uh, caught my eye. Um, you know, post-Christian, progressive, secular Europe, getting worse and worse by the week, it seems. Those were great episodes. Um, what was your most, most vivid memory of this European experience? Was there any one city or place that was more hostile or more open? Or what was that like? What comes back in my memory is the chocolate they had in Europe. <laughs> Christians knew about our ministry, and they'd wait when we arrived by train, our team, and they'd have bundles of chocolate to give us. It was just really <laughs> neat. But, you know, we, we did uh, that uh, 13 countries in 13 days, with 13 episodes filmed, wow. to particularly show that the, the moral law works on any culture. Sure. You don't have to go to a country, dress like them, and spend two years as a missionary learning their language and uh, learning the culture, of course, you're culturally sensitive, but God's given light to every man. Every human being has a conscience. The work of the law is written on the heart. So whether it be German, uh, Swiss, uh, French, whatever, just use an interpreter and just say, mm -hmm. you've got a conscience, you know, right from wrong. You have done things that are morally wrong. You look at the commandments and you need a savior. And they understand it. I almost got beaten up in, uh, I can't remember where it was, uh, when we first arrived, I think it was Budapest, not sure. But in Milan, I opened air preached to a large crowd, and this homeless guy came and stood right next to me. And I thought, this guy's just being annoying. He's standing too close. And I finished, and he then said, uh, I am the top police officer in Milan. Come with me. And uh, he was very angry because he said we'd filmed him when he was in plain clothes. We didn't know he was in plain clothes. I thought he was this homeless guy. <laughs> so he yelled at me in, in uh, Spanish for about an hour just going on and on and on and had me sign this form uh, head at the bottom, ill transgressor. It says, I'm a transgressor. So wow. I thought I certainly am. So I signed the form. He was thrilled. I don't know what I really signed. And then he wanted photos with us, me and my photographer, which was really <laughs> weird when he was mad that we took us, filmed him, yeah. and, uh, and he let us go. So that was very interesting because I thought I'm going to be thrown into some prison and left there, but God yeah. opened doors and wow. it was wonderful. Wow, that's fantastic. And in the same way, I would guess, if you're uh, preaching on the streets here, uh, whether you have uh, Jehovah Witnesses or Mormons, you also don't necessarily have to know everything about what they believe to bring to bring them the gospel either. I mean, you've simplified it for a lot of people here, I think, but just understanding, you know, have your copy of the Ten Commandments and, and just go through uh, the law and, and, uh, and grace. And you say the law breaks the hard heart and the gospel heals the broken heart. And that's true of everyone. So I really like that you're saying that, you know, you don't have to necessarily be an apologist and to, to bring the gospel to people as long as you talk about sin and righteousness and judgment. And I want to ask you about talking on the streets of uh, America these days. One, um, one that I remember specifically, you were talking uh, uh, to young people and they asked them who Adolf Hitler was. Now, the majority of the youth had no idea who he was as if 
his presence on the world stage meant nothing of importance to them. Uh, and I was a little bit shocked by them. Did that shock you? And, and have people ever said other things that really took you by surprise? Nothing surprises me after <laughs> the last few years. But yeah, that was 180, the beginning of 180. Oh, okay. Life. Right. It was actually, I embarked upon the making of a, um, a movie called Hitler's Religion because it was very fascinating. Hitler believed in God. He was a baby kisser, um, like all politicians, and he knew if he mentioned God um, and that he was a Christian that it would get him votes, and it certainly did until he got in power. And that's what politicians do. They yeah. they deceive the hearts of the simple. So I went to a local college and said, you've heard of Adolf Hitler? No, let me tell you what happened in the beginning. I went to a college and I asked people, who is Hitler? And a few didn't know, and I thought, this is terrible. But one day I went with my camera and there was a guy with dreadlocks and he was very colorful, colorful looking and uh, he was under a tree. We had to go under a tree because it was very bright sunlight. Um, and he was absolutely angry at what the Nazis had done. And I found an educated college student. It was quite amazing. And uh, I thought, this is great. And then I just said to him out of the blue, what do you think of abortion? He said, it's a woman's right to choose. I said, you Nazi, you're just like the Nazis. And we, we, <laughs> we crossed swords for about five or ten minutes. Mm -hmm. Really, really. Wow. He was very angry because I'd wow. said that. And then I said to him, uh, okay, I'd say, okay to kill a baby in the womb. We acknowledge it's a baby. When? And he couldn't answer me. He couldn't answer that question because of his conscience. Mm -hmm. And he stormed off, just really angry. And I remember filming him as he storms off, thinking, this is just incredible. And then I push, pushed the off button on my camera, and it turned on. And what I'd done in the sunlight, the bright sunlight, is turn the camera off for the interview and turned it on at the end. So I wow. missed that whole incredible interview. Wow. And I just felt so stupid. I didn't tell anybody about it for a week. But I thought, you know, that question I asked him, it's a baby in the womb, yes. It's okay to kill a baby in the womb when? I'm going to go back and do it again. And so I went back, asked people about Hitler, and then crossed to uh, abortion and found there was eight people who changed their minds about abortion once they acknowledged that they couldn't justify killing a baby mm -hmm. in the womb. They changed their minds about abortion. And I thought, we don't have a Hitler video here. We have a pro-life video. So we named it 180, and it... Uh, I think it got a million views on YouTube in about two days. Wow. And I think it's on six or five wow. or six million now. And we gave away a million DVDs uh, in universities across the country. Wow. So uh, I thank God for that yeah. 180 movie. And people can watch that on livingwaters.com. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. We've also got fullyfreefilms.com. We can watch okay. about 14 of our movies free of charge. Yeah. Okay. Fullyfreefilms.com and livingwaters.com or our YouTube channel, which has just passed... Uh, 309 million views, which just, just blows us away that mm. we've got such access into this dark world with the mm -hmm. gospel. And you're still on YouTube because I know they, they kick people off on a regular basis. And we, my husband and I watch watch the interviews all the time. We enjoy them immensely. And, and it really helps us to sharpen sharpen our, our witnessing skills. I want to ask you about today's youth because when I was a parent, it became somewhat trendy to say, I'm raising my children with no religion at all so they can choose for themselves when they get older. I think that was a horrible cop-out at the least and an epic disaster at the worst. They are not choosing anything but humanism. Do you find that young people uh, are different today? They, they have no understanding of spiritual things or is it sort of a mixed bag? It's a mixed bag, but there's a lot of darkness out there. But COVID did the mm. church an incredible favor. Mm. Um, what I do when I go to a college, I go to college, college, a local college twice a day on my electric bike with my dog, and the dog sits on a platform. She wears sunglasses, and it gets me <laughs> an inroad with any stranger. They come mm -hmm. up and say, what a cute dog. I say, you got a dog? You want to do an interview for YouTube? And that's how I get my interviews. Great. But I found... This is an effective way to reach anyone. So you believe in God? No, no. Ever read the Bible? No. I say, well, did you know the Old Testament says that God promised he would destroy death? Did you know that? And the New Testament that tells us how he did it? Did you know that? I say, no. And I know they've got a fear of death. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that all humanity, Hebrews 2.15, all humanity is haunted by the fear of death all their lifetime. So I say, you're afraid of dying? They say, no, come on. Someone's going to put you in a box and bury you six feet under the ground. Yeah. So, well, I am a little bit. A little bit? It's a horror beyond words. And you see their eyes widen. Mm. And they say, how does this guy know I'm fearful of death? I haven't told anybody. Oh. But I know because Scripture tells me. So I tap into that. 
and talk about how the Bible promises that God will destroy death. Isaiah 25, verse 8, he will swallow up death forever. That's the promise of God. And so it opens their heart because most people are anti-God or anti-Bible um, just out of ignorance. And it's, it's not they've got evidence for whatever they believe. It's the fact they love their sins. Oh. Often I'll say to an atheist, you're an atheist, yeah? So you believe the scientific impossibility that nothing created everything? Nothing made flowers, birds, trees, the sun, the moon, the stars, the seasons, the human eye, the marvels of the human brain, the miracle of childbirth, all happened because nothing created it. Do you really believe that? Or is it you just love your porn and you're having sex with your mm -hmm. girlfriend and you know God would frown upon it and you see his mouth turn up at the edges because he knows I'm speaking the truth. And it is. Wow. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So all these silly arguments about, yeah. you know, evolution and atheism, uh, they're all just uh, red herrings, rabbit trails, and yeah. just don't go up them. Just go straight for the conscience, as Jesus did, and say, do you yeah. think you're a good person? Yeah, I'm a really good person. Well, let's go through the commandments. And ex one of the most powerful things I've learned is an exposition of Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And I find this gets people's eyes widened straight away. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how argumentative they are. Have you ever heard of this Bible verse, the wages of sin is death? They say no. That's very famous. It's saying God is paying you in death for your sins. Like a judge who looks at a criminal who's committed murder, but he's not concerned and he thinks, you know, I'm a good person anyway, basically. The judge says to him, I'm going to show you how serious your crime is. I'm giving you the death sentence. This is your wages. This is what you've earned. And then I say to the person, Eric, sin is so serious to a holy God, he's given you the death sentence. You're on death row. And your death will be evidence to you that God is deadly serious about sin. And you've earned your wages by telling me you're in a fornicated relationship and you're a liar, a thief, and a blasphemer. So you're in big trouble. And you see their head bow as the, as, because mm -hmm. the law stops every mouth, as Scripture says. Mm -hmm. Wow. Very, very powerful. Um, Ray, we hardly have any time left here at all. Uh, people are the same everywhere, aren't they? They just have different masks and different identities. Uh, anything else you want to say as we wrap up here? 50 years of open-air preaching, everything I've learned, and it really is. It is such a good book. Um, any closing comments, anything that we missed today? You know, usually at the end of an interview, <clears throat> people will say, have you any last words? <laughs> well, when you're coming up to 75, have you any last words mean something different yes. than, than the end of the interview? Yes. <laughs> But I would just like to say, I've written that book because um, at 75, you're just thankful to wake up every morning. And I want to give a, a baton to the next generation and say, you can do this. It's mm. not as hard as you think. Don't believe the, the lies of the enemy. Let love swallow your fears. <clears throat> Start small. Speak to two or three people at once, four or five. And then be challenged to get go somewhere where there's a crowd and Get up and begin with trivia, giving away $1 bills. We call it a singles ministry. We collect singles during the week and uh, and then learn to swing and swing from the natural to the spiritual. And this book will really help you. And watching a YouTube channel channel yeah. will really help also. Yeah, yeah. And it does. You have so many different chapters on here of, of the history of the ministry and also um, – dealing with hecklers, how to get started, the re importance of the response, other religions, uh, the big battle getting carried away, Spurgeon's wisdom, what a great chapter, uh, because I know gentlemen like those, uh, Spurgeon and, and Whitefield, and those gentlemen were uh, important in, in how the Lord used them. Uh, they passed the torch to you, basically, and now you are going to be passing the torch at some point to others. Ray Comfort, thank you so much for your time. Lord, bless your labors for the kingdom and uh, just everything that you're putting your hand to, and we will be praying for you and your ministry as the days grow darker and darker. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. God bless. All right, we are going to take a break here. We're going to get to some headlines in the second half. There's so much going on in the world. And um, if you missed the first half with Ray Comfort, we will be posting the podcast shortly after we are done. So stay with me for part two, and we will update you on some current headlines and all kinds of mischief going on in this crazy world. So stay with me. Be back soon. Q90FM presents the Police Lights of Christmas, helping over 70 police departments across Wisconsin. Each department is going to leave this night with a box full of thousands of dollars worth of gift cards. Visit lightsofchristmas.us. Police Lights of Christmas, a ministry of Q90FM. 
Feedback, questions, and topic suggestions are always appreciated. Email us at comments at standupforthetruth.com. Welcome back to Stand Up For The Truth for this Friday, September 20th. And we just got done speaking with Ray Comfort. And what a blessing he's been to the body of Christ. And uh, his reward awaits him. 50 years of open-air preaching, everything I've learned, uh, is just a delightful read. Um, And not just the history of uh, Living Waters and his ministry, but also um, how to go about it. And and it's just full of a lot of wonderful wisdom and advice. And I'm sure that Ray is um, an expert on human nature by this point in his life. And so the book is linked to uh, the podcast post. So if you're looking for a way to get a hold of that book, you will find it in the link in the post. I want to go back to uh, Isaiah, briefly Isaiah 1, and that's where I started today, and I love those verses. I want to bring a little bit of context to it before I get to some headlines. Um, We want to talk about a holy God who cannot look on sin and the danger of the human tendency to think that we can bring something to the table when we, or if we ever, desire to encounter God on purpose. We try to bring some righteousness. It makes us feel better and makes us feel less guilty. There's works. How many religions are based on works? The one I came out of was based on works. And I started to wonder about if if works get you to heaven, if works are so important, then why aren't people falling all over themselves to do good in this world? They are not. It is a fig leaf. Uh, Works uh, has nothing to do with our salvation. Uh, And I found when I cracked a Bible that that was absolutely true. So a few verses surrounding that verse I want to read. And then also uh, just a paragraph from the Days of Praise devotional from ICR, Institute for Creation Research. So here is Isaiah 1, 17 to 20. We only read verse 18 at the beginning. And it says, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, Rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Verse 19, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. From, for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. That's pretty straightforward, right? Well, here's the paragraph from uh, um, Days of Praise. This is several years old, but it's so good. And it's called reason, not negotiation. Perhaps the term reason together conjures up images of two parties seated at a bargaining table ready to discuss issues and negotiate a compromise. Nothing could be further from the truth. The words reason together have been translated from one Hebrew word that means to be right or correct or to justify or convict. It is not two parties bringing their own private view to the table. It is that there is only one correct and just perception of the matter. The inviter, God himself says, let us see this correctly together. And I really, really like that because this is not some sort of Hegelian dialectic that God is sitting down saying, let's come to some sort of uh, agreement on what is required of you to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. But those verses around that verse tell us all that we need to know uh, that God is the one who sets the terms for surrender, as I call it. So in light of what we discussed with uh, Ray Comfort this morning, I think this is a great passage because of the three elements of sharing the truth that he does and he talks about. Talk about sin and righteousness, where that comes from, and judgment. So people get the big picture because if they don't know that they're sinners and they're relying on their own righteousness to get to heaven, then the gospel is not seen as good news to them. And they need to know that God sets the terms. There's only one way to heaven, one mediator, and every human has to come to terms with that. So I do think Isaiah 1 communicates that very clearly. And we agree with God about eternal matters. So that is the wrap-up of my interview with Ray Comfort. And what a a blessing that is. He is a treasure to the church. And uh, we need to pray for him. He is on the front lines uh, with bringing the gospel to people. So what a great legacy he has. All right, headlines. Uh, We'll wrap this up with some headlines this morning. New details emerge on how Israel struck 4,000 Hezbollah terrorists in mass pager bombing. The pagers were imported months ago. This is from the Daily Wire, by the way. The pagers were imported months ago from uh, from a Taiwan company, but were only recently given to the terrorists. Israel reportedly infiltrated Hezbollah's supply chain and rigged thousands of pagers with 
pentaerythritol tetranitrate, a highly explosive material which was then remotely detonated simultaneously. The pagers were programmed to beep for several seconds before exploding, according to the New York Times. A tiny bit of explosive material was placed in each pager next to the battery and was detonated with a switch that allowed the bomb to be triggered remotely. In other words, the uh, the, the lithium battery, which is already perilous in certain situations, began to heat up. Um, prox- uh, it says 4,000 were injured, 500 in critical condition, 11 were killed. And what I mentioned yesterday on headline day is this is a whole new day when it comes to warfare on this planet, perilous times. It says the pagers were imported months ago from Taiwan, but were only recently given to the terrorists, a small and then um, So Mossad apparently injected this. This is what is going around is what happened. I don't know that anyone knows exactly, so I preface it with that. And then it says Israel, this Daily Wire article says Israel's plan was to detonate the pagers in the event that it entered a full-blown war with Hezbollah so that it would have a clear advantage at the outset of the fighting. However, Israel was forced to detonate the pagers quickly after it learned that two Hezbollah members had figured out that they had been breached. Uh, when the first member suspected foul play several days ago, he was killed. When the second member figured out that the devices had been compromised, Israel was forced to make a decision. Hezbollah had their fighters switch to using pagers because they believed Israel was monitoring their cell phone communications. The U.S. was not alerted to the plan, presumably because Israel cannot trust the pro-Biden-Harris administration. It's an interesting little sidelight there. Um. Here's this other one also. IDF moves thousands of troops to northern border. And this is from this is from two days ago. This is World Israel News staff. Amid sky-high tensions between Israel and the Hezbollah terror group, the Israeli army announced on Wednesday it is deploying tens of thousands of troops to the northern border. The move comes one day after an alleged Mossad and IDF intelligence operation saw the detonation of thousands of beepers. The IDF said it was transferring the elite 98th Division, numbering 10 to 20,000 troops to the border with Lebanon. I would say this is an escalation. They were previously uh, stationed in central Gaza, but they withdrew from the area in August. The 98th Division will join the 36th Division and numerous reserve units, units which have been scattered along the northern border for months. In recent days, Israeli officials have signaled that the IDF is gearing up for an intensive military offensive against Hezbollah. Um, Netanyahu and the defense minister, Gallant, have both hinted to Biden that they feel the time has run out for a diplomatic solution. And, of course, people always want the hostages to come home. Um, Let's close that chapter and move on to the next chapter. It goes on to say at least 60,000 Israelis were displaced from, displaced from their homes due to the ongoing aerial assaults. Tens of thousands more who were not evacuated from their homes live under constant threat of aggression. So something, you know, is going to give probably sooner rather than later. And, of course, pray for Israel. Pray for her leaders. Pray for the people over there. Um, wow. Wow. All right, switching gears a bit. Here's a headline from today. 20 supporters seated behind Trump on stage rushed to ER with blurred vision and eye burns after a rally in Tucson, Arizona. So, you know, what's going on here is obviously just an all-out hatred for Trump and his followers. I don't know. I tend to think that uh, the more they sabotage these rallies, the more people will stay home. They will be able to say, well, look, nobody's showing up for these rallies. I can't imagine why that would be. But we have uh, people reporting a vision blurred, a swelling, a swelling on their faces, uh, rushing to the ER. Um, so there's just so much going on there, and there's so much mystery uh, regarding this latest assassination attempt. Um, and they're making him look like sort of a Looney Tunes But I think there were probably some deep connections there. Some are saying, is there a mole in the Secret Service who's letting uh, people know where Trump is because this was a last-minute decision to go golfing? There's so much we don't know. 
Here's an interesting one. Rep- Representative Dan Muser says ABC could be summoned to testify in Congress. We now have a whistleblower. We are going to do what we can to bring ABC in. ABC News may soon find itself testifying before Congress over allegations of bias during last week's Trump-Harris debate. It is suspected that Harris knew the questions in advance due to her out-of-the-ordinary, well-prepared responses. Last week, Senator Roger Marshall uh, from Kansas suggested that a Senate investigation into ABC News and Harris's campaign for suspected collusion in last week's rigged debate has begun. Representative Dan Muser scrutinized NBC News following an alleged whistleblower affidavit that suggests the network may have colluded with the Harris campaign. The unconfirmed whistleblower affidavit alleges that ABC provided her with sample questions ahead of the debate and promised not to fact-check her responses, an arrangement that only targeted Trump for real-time fact-checking. The alleged affidavit, signed and notarized on September 9, 2024, included a certified letter allegedly sent to Speaker Mike Johnson and recordings of conversations that support his claims. The Harris team tightly controlled the narrative by dictating the scope of questions allowed in interviews. On September 4th, CNN senior White House correspondent M.J. Lee wrote, There have been some assurances offered to the Harris campaign about how much the network would handle any moments of significant crosstalk, including mics being turned on, as well as moderator discouraging disruptive interruptions and explaining to viewers what is being said. So uh, he was interviewed with uh, Maria Bartiromo of Fox Business News recently, and there's a transcript for that. This is interesting. Um... Maria said, I'm glad you, uh, okay, Dan, Dan Muser, he said, we have a whistleblower. I'm going to tell you something, Maria. We're going to do what we can to bring ABC in and answer some of these questions. And um, she said, I'm glad you mentioned this because Fox is reaching out to ABC for a response to the affidavit. And this Bill Ackman posted about this whistleblower. We want answers. But Bill Ackman posted on X about an alleged whistleblower affidavit that says the Harris campaign dictated the debate questions, camera angles, and fact-checking. And what's so interesting about that is we noticed right away the camera angles were dictated, of course, because it was always on her both faces at once. And so then her, what I would call very childish um, facial expressions, could constantly get people to think what is she thinking, and why is she scoffing, and why is she smirking? So that's very, very interesting. Uh, Bill Ackman is a billionaire investor. He's a hedge fund manager. He's worth $9 billion. He called Disney's CEO, Bob Iger, to address his concerns. So he's got, you know, he's a, a very rich man, very influential man, um, this Bill Ackman. And he, he's very pro-Israel, and he's got a few things that he wants to say about this. Um, and so this is a very interesting transcript. So uh, if, if you want to read up about this again, this is Dan Muser says ABC News could be summoned to testify in Congress. I have a couple questions of my own, and I will move on to the last couple things here. Is One is why did Trump agree to ABC News as a moderator? Because I thought he even had a lawsuit uh, with ABC News. So I don't know anything about that, but I was very surprised that he allowed ABC. Um, he should have known that, that he was just going to be ambushed anyway. And I guess my one thought on all of this is, why can't each candidate choose a moderator of their choice uh, to make sure that the questions that they want asked are asked and that they can be properly represented to the American people? So um, just I'll keep an eye on that to see if there are any, any hearings in Congress. I'd be certainly interested in whether ABC is being uh, brought in. If, are their news ratings going down? I really don't know, but just more to think about couple more headlines here before we wrap up this podcast. Uh, you're listening to Stand Up For The Truth for this Friday, September the 20th. And we had Ray Comfort on in the first pa- half. If you missed that, you can get the podcast uh, shortly after we're done today. And just some headlines here in the second half. UN General Assembly passes resolution calling for Jerusalem Old City to be Jew-free. Wow, they're just getting brighter and brighter at the UN, aren't they? They're geniuses. The Palestinian front fronted resolution passed by a wide margin demanding that the Israeli army and Jewish residents evacuate to pre-1949 line within a year. This is from the Jewish News Syndicate. Jerusalem's old city, in addition to Judea and Samaria, must be uh, Judenrein, Jew-free, within a year, according to a Palestinian drafted resolution, 
which the UN General Assembly passed on Wednesday. So this would be two days ago. It passed 124 to 14 with 43 abstentions. And it's meant to give force to a July advisory opinion by the International Court of Justice, some more global geniuses, which declared Israeli presence to be illegal in any area over the 1949 armistice line. More than 40 countries sponsored the resolution, which was the first that Palestinians filed after being granted unprecedented privileges for non-UN member earlier this year. It calls on the Israeli Defense Forces to withdraw completely from Judea and Samaria, eastern Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip within 12 months and includes Jerusalem's old city. So if you have ever been there, you know how insane this is. It also bans arms sales to the IDF of any equipment that would be expected reasonably to be used in the territory over the 1949 line, etc., etc., and blah, blah, blah. The vote came a day after a debate on Tuesday, after a day of debate on Tuesday, um, those opposing Argentina, Fiji, Hungary, Malawi, Micronesia, Palau, Papua New Guinea, Paraguay, Tonga, the U.S., and Israel in opposing the resolution. Notably, Germany, the U.K., Canada, Italy, Ukraine, and Australia were among those who abstained. So uh, opposing the resolution and abstaining are two different things. So that is something we need to watch, I guess. But you know, General Assembly resolutions have no legal enforcement. Um, but I would imagine down the road being used in international courts to seek additional action, um, action against the Jewish state would not be too impossible to predict. So, you know, same song, second verse on a lot of these sort of things. Um, uh, and then the other one, they, they believe that there is a mole uh, in the Secret Service. That's an absolute mess. Um, and this is Representative Matt Getz. Some colleagues are suspicious of a Secret Service mole. This was published on Breitbart yesterday. Some lawmakers are suspicious of a mole in the U.S. Secret Service following the second assassination of attempt. Ass attempt. Host Mike Slater uh, pointed to the fact that now, after the second assassination attempt on Trump, the aura of invincibility of the Secret Service is disappearing, which could lead to more individuals with ill intent attempting to go after the former president. I hesitate to even share this um, statistic, but... Um, and polls, you know, some of us think polls are good. Some of us think polls are baloney. So we're going to be subject to polls constantly, and I have mixed feelings about them. But if this one's true, it is, it's, it's ugly. At 28%, they did a poll of, of Democrats, 28% of Democrats believe that the country's better off if Trump is assassinated. Now, I wouldn't say that out loud if I was anyone because that is, um, that enters a realm in this country and in, you know, life that is just unacceptable that people think that, that hate and murder are okay. And lawlessness is abounding, of course. We understand that. We were told that was going to happen. And so you'd have to take a poll of more than 1,000 people. But in those 1,000 people, 28% believe that it is okay to take out a political opponent. opponent. And this uh, America is losing its soul, has lost its soul, when a political opponent, um, people don't think twice about believing that... Um, <sighs> Anyway, I'm going to leave that there. Very, very grievous. Getz said there is such a disdain for Trump and there's such a desire to diminish him within some of these agencies that giving him less protection, not having him surrounded by a bunch of strongmen that appear authoritative, um, that the type of a virtue signal to drain protective resources away is tolerated because in their heart they don't think much of him. Well, that's an understatement. Um, of, of, the sub, of the suspect, the one on Sunday... Getz said it will be quite concerning if they find out he was receiving communications or inspiration of, or financing from foreign entities. This is deeply concerning. Of course, we have to consider Russia and Iran in trying to influence um, <laughs> this election. He says, this is deeply concerning. The fact that days before, days before this assassination attempt, I had someone from Homeland Security in my office warning me about a Ukrainian assassination team working in the country. And then this guy shows up. Proverbially, proverbially wrapped in the Ukrainian flag, lobbing bullets into Trump National. That's concerning to me. Those connections have to be looked at. And yes, this, this uh, suspect uh, did spend time in Ukraine um, 
getting volunteers to fight Russia. So, well, the connections are going to go on and on and on. Very, very interesting. And again, I don't know that we'll ever know the whole story. I think we've become used to that to some degree of not knowing the whole story about about who's going after who. So we need to trust the Lord with this and, and keep it in perspective based on the hour being late. Um, and indeed it is, next week we have Gary Ka and Terry James. He's here on Tuesday. And we're going to talk about how late the hour is. Both of these gentlemen have been watching the signs for a very, very long time. And so uh, we like to glean from what they have to share with us. Um, well, we got maybe time for another headline here. Um, mostly about Israel, uh, Iran. We got to consider Iran. It's, it's so uh, easy to look at these proxy nations, the Houthis, uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, and not think about Iran. Israeli atomic chief says Iran is closer to developing nuclear weapons than it claims. Uh, this gentleman gave a talk at the International Atomic Energy Agency's annual conference on Tuesday. And he says Iran continues to deceive the agency and the international community regarding the advancement of its nuclear program. Surprise, surprise. It is the main source of regional instability and poses a great th threat to peace and security worldwide. This reality, he says, requires the full attention of the international community now more than ever before. There is no doubt that Iran conducted a military nuclear program aimed to produce several nuclear weapons devices. And we've been talking about this for some time on Stand Up. And uh, over the summer, we talked about just how close they might be. Can you imagine... Uh, something like that going on. And doesn't Israel have enough to focus on right now, their very survival, being surrounded by those who wish them to be pushed into the sea, add a nuclear Iran into this situation? And Iran's been pretty quiet, uh, but they, they can be because they have others doing their dirty work for them. So uh, that's something worth keeping an eye on. Um, Bible prophecy is just ramping up at an incredible pace. And we always encourage the listener to be informed, inform your kids, have a plan if things go south in this country. Um, America losing its soul is a very, very grievous thing. Um, and this extent, existential war is what we call this in Israel, even though we know that the God who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. So we know that what God is doing behind the scenes that we are not privy to, and that's okay. But this headline by Michael Snyder, the ex existential war that is rapidly escalating in the Middle East will be far more horrible than most people dare to imagine, and we don't want to imagine that. But he says, um, what we just witnessed in the Middle East shocked the entire globe. A lot more death and destruction is coming. Whether they are both willing to admit it or not, the truth is that Israel and Hezbollah are at war. It is a limited war for now. It is a matter of time before it escalates into an all-out war that kills uh, vast numbers of people on both sides. This is interesting because I, I soon found as we get towards the uh, anniversary of October 7th, um, I, it seemed to me that even after a few weeks, I thought, this is an open-ended thing that no one saw coming. This, I don't think this is ever going to end. And here we are, nearly a year later. Um, hostages have not been released. And new methods of warfare, game-changing methods, that have put all of these terrorists on alert. Like I said yesterday, it seems like Israel's saying, you think you know what terrorism is? We're going to show you what terrorism is. So it's getting ramped up on both sides, and it will continue to and it makes this peace treaty that begins the tribulation even more intriguing to me if this is the war, the unending war that people are so tired and weary of and fearful of at this point. There's a fear factor. Um, it reverberates around the world, and the U.S. is not um, holding up their end of any of this. So just think about all of these factors. And again, pray for Israel's leaders. Pray for America's leaders. we got an election coming up. This is the biggest election of my time. Absolutely. This is a game-changing um, 
world affecting um, election. Vote, vote for pro-life, pro-family, and and opportunities to still share the gospel as long as we can. This is the one thing we're going to have left, right? Amidst all the shouting and the violence, that's the one thing. That's the one weapon we have. So keep sharing that. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Jude, verse 21. We have a mighty, bright future. Keep that in mind. So have a great, great weekend, and I'll see you next week.